equals to m a. In that the acceleration, that is the a, it is uniform acceleration. What happens if it is non-uniform acceleration? How can we derive that? Well, that's a good question. Actually, f equals m a, of course, still holds if it's non-uniform acceleration, but everything else in kinematics, like for example, you might be used to the equation v is equal to v not e plus half a t squared. In fact, this will change, and so will everything else. The way to derive them for non-uniform acceleration is through calculus. So essentially, for example, if you want to find the formula for distance, you first have to realize that acceleration is like the second derivative of distance with respect to time. What that means is that velocity is just the change in distance over time, the rate of change. And so acceleration is just the rate of change in velocity. And so when you combine these two together, when you combine one GDP over the other, you get e squared dt squared x. So it's the second derivative with respect to time of x. What that means is that you can take distance and rewrite it as the integral of acceleration with respect to time, and then the integral of whatever you get out with respect to time. So then that will change a little bit because in uniform acceleration, this is just a constant like this. And a constant is integrated very simply. The integral of a constant is just ct. But then, when you have this, well, ct plus dt, then this integral is also simple. You just get half ct squared plus dt plus d. So, of course, the case for a constant is simple. But you asked about non-uniform acceleration. And in that case, it totally depends on what function is inside here. It could be anything, in fact. For example, if it's e to the t, then you could just have this and this. So it actually depends on what function you use, because uniform is something very specific. But non-uniform could be anything. So the general formula, as close as you can get to one, is this. I have uh, one more question from the cemetery, so if you don't mind, can I ask? Sure. No. Um, it's fine. Let's just see. Most of the part of an atom is unfilled as compared to the filled part. So why can't we observe that from a mechanized? Actually, well, that's mostly because atoms are very, very, very small. So small that, I mean, there's no way you can even perceive one with your naked eyes at all. Mostly because these atoms, well, billions of them, go into one cell. If you look as hard as you can with your naked eye at your skin, you still can't tell where the cells are. Because it takes millions of them to even go into one hair follicle. And then you can just barely see your hair follicles on your skin. And thousands of those make up your arm. Which means even if you try really, really, really hard, you can't see but I think I get what you're asking in reality. Why don't we just see a bunch of empty space all the time? Why don't we just see protons and electrons floating everywhere if everything is 99.9% empty? And personally, I think the answer is we get light from these photons. So these photons are going to strike the atom in places only where electrons are there. It's only going to strike at us if there's an electron or something else there. If not, it's going to continue until it hits another atom. And enough, in the likelihood it hits an atom is very, very high considering how many atoms there are in your arm. So essentially, the lights we do have are only detected if they're there. It's not going to show you in empty space. Thank you, sir. No problem. No problem.